Thank you very much for the kind introduction and uh, thank to the organizers for inviting me in the first place. So uh, yeah, I just put up this, uh, these uh, um, pictures to show how nice Aarhus is. Just 10 kilometers outside the city is just very rural and, uh, and, and uh, likable. And uh, the reason why I put it there is uh, I'm looking for postdocs. So uh, come and join me in, uh, in Aarhus. Okay, so uh, what this presentation will be about is uh, global optimization. And I'll, I'll motivate in a minute uh, why that is important. And, um, and the global optim optimization can be accelerated by introducing machine learning so, so that whatever you get, uh, uh, whatever kind of data you get on your way while optimizing, you sort of stuff that into uh, models and, and uh, ask these models in various ways. I'll, I'll present two ways of doing it uh, for help. And then they help you find uh, your global minimum um, or at least something better than you, are, um, you, you have at, a, at any given moment. Uh, and since uh, they are uh, based on data, they can be very fast and, and hence speed up your, your search. And um, the first part, uh, the first example is uh, introduction of uh, machine learning potentials. So, so that is also something covered by quite a few other talks. Um, uh, but I have my take on it. <laughs> and then the second part is uh, more into the artificial intelligence where we, we use the machine learning to, to help us directly draw the solution rather than uh, help us understand the interaction between uh, the, uh, the elements. And so far I didn't say what the elements were, but this will be about uh, um, the density functional theory calculation. So, so the elements are atoms and they are uh, interacting via uh, normal uh, Coulomb uh, interactions and, and we have uh, wave functions for the electrons and, and so on. But in principle, uh, the, the methods that I introduce could also be applied uh, in other domains. So first, uh, a little motivation why it is we need the global optimization at all. I mean, why don't we just have a machine where we stuff in the, the laws of physics and then we do the simulation and out comes the, the most favorable state of uh, matter. Um, and I, I'll, I'll motivate that by showing you an example. Uh, here's a, a lead um, pattern. So that's low electron, uh, electron uh, low energy electron diffraction. Um, that shows that if you have a reduced tin oxide surface, it, um, it, it, it has a, a, a diffraction pattern which reveals that this, the symmetry, the translational symmetry on the surface uh, is uh, uh, one in, in one crystallographic direction and four in another crystallographic direction. And uh, this was taken more than 20 years ago. And uh, back at that time, uh, people came up with some models uh, for what could what could be the underlying surface structure that caused this uh, diffraction pattern? And uh, these are uh, the, the two popular models that sort of survived uh, the, uh, the lacmus test that uh, someone did a DFT calculation and realized that the atoms were uh, stable in, in these positions and uh, that the overall energy for these structures was uh, good compared to any other structures you could uh, come up with. And uh, then only after very elaborate development of new and better methods uh, did uh, people come up with the right structure for, uh, for this uh, surface. And it looks completely different to what we uh, initially guessed more than 20 years ago. And, um, and once you have seen it, you sort of see, okay, it seems that, that it's a natural structure. I mean, that's, if you look at it, it's, it, it has a, a small cluster of tin three oxygen, I don't know, three or five. And, uh, and that is repeated uh, along uh, this uh, direction um, and, and inverted, which is exactly what can also be revealed from the lead pattern that there is a light plane uh, on the surface and, 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 and you sort of see why is it there we have that light plane that's because then we can pack those clusters very closely but getting the idea um, that this is the solution is not 
obvious. I mean, someone has to guess it or a machine has to sort of trawl through a whole lot of uh, different structures and then accidentally come upon this one and, um, and, t and tell us that. So, so that is what um, would be sort of the underlying theme uh, of my presentation. That is, how can we have the simulation do that? And how can we speed up that uh, search? So uh, I realized yesterday that uh, not everyone is a DFT practitioner. So I'll just uh, motivate uh, with a few words uh, why we use that kind of um, uh, description for the materials. So you could, uh, you could start out by, by uh, setting up simulations where you had Elena Jones uh, potential. I'm, I'm sure you all know about that. Uh, and, and then it could be very fast and uh, not very accurate. So, so you wouldn't want to do that. You would, you would want to introduce some quantum mechanics so that the electrons are, are described by wave functions and, and you get some, pro, some decent uh, material science description. And uh, tight binding could be uh, an option. Uh, there are uh, parameters for many elements and you can get quite far. Um, and, uh, and especially you can get a lot of understanding but it, it turns out that the, the, the tiny last bit that determines whether, let's say, that surface reconstruction I just showed for uh, tin oxide, whether that is the preferred one or not, that cannot be captured with tight binding. Or at least if you, if you did capture it, you would not be certain that it was because of your choice of um, parameters or if it was really uh, the, the correct answer. So you would like to go deep into quantum chemistry and, uh, and some colleagues, they uh, then uh, adopt the methods where you have many body wave functions and uh, they, they attain a high accuracy of their calculations, but they also pay a tremendous price. Uh, they, they climb up here. Uh, you can see on, on this y-axis here, they climb up very high and, uh, and, and just wait forever and can treat only a few uh, atomic systems, and then the 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 the, um, uh, the method of choice for material science, as some of you might know, uh, is uh, density function theory, where you you do not have the many body wave function. You have a set of um, uh, uh, single uh, particle wave functions describing the electrons, and then the the part that was inside the many body wave function uh, is lost. I mean, that, that intricate interaction that uh, the, the describing electrons with a many body wave function uh, that, that causes, that, that is now no longer in your, in your uh, base equations, but you stuff it in again uh, by something called the exchange correlation uh, potential. And, and that sort of assures that these independent um, or these uh, electrons described by one electron wave functions that they interact in almost the right way as if they were described by many body wave functions. And, and as you see here, um, oops, it's, it's not really clear on, uh, because I cover no, some of it here, but as you see with DFT, we, we lose a little bit of accuracy, uh, but we also get a faster method. We climb down a little bit here on the y-axis. So, so, so that is the motivation for doing it with DFT. And, uh, and then we need to, uh, to do the search. And there are some obvious methods. You could do molecular dynamics. So that's the, uh, the red trajectory over here in some energy landscape. So you describe your system at a given temperature. It might be you do uh, annealing. So you, you lower the temperature as your um, uh, simulation goes. Um, and all you need for that is uh, the capability of, of getting forces. And, and that is, of course, just the minus the gradient of, of the energy, which you could get from the density functional theory. Uh, so, so that is a very straightforward uh, thing to do. You could also do um, a Monte Carlo search where you uh, would start somewhere in this landscape uh, with one of the blue dots. Then you will do something to the structure, rattle the atoms or interchange atoms of different kinds or something. And, uh, and then you will uh, evaluate the energy at that new place. And uh, if, uh, if it's lower than where you started out, you immediately accept that new structure. If it's higher, you only do it with a, a certain uh, likelihood. 
And then you have basing hopping, which uh, is uh, uh, very akin to uh, Monte Carlo. In basing hopping, you do the same perturbation, you get somewhere else uh, in the energy landscape, and then you do a local optimization. You, you do a steepest descent uh, in the energy landscape and find the, the nearest uh, local minimum uh, after that perturbation. So, so a basing hopping would be coming from down here, accidentally uh, getting up here, uh, let, let's say getting up here on the, on the hillside, and then doing the relaxation and then ending up down here in, in this minimum. Okay, so, so there are some established methods and, and you can very easily uh, implement them. This is a first year uh, exercise at Aarhus University uh, when the students, they learn uh, Python, then I, I give them this exercise of optimizing a small Leonard Jones uh, cl cluster um, uh, by means of, of a uh, Monte Carlo uh, um, optimization. Now, um, there's some considerations here, because if you are going to solve something that hasn't been solved yet, <laughs> like uh, the, the, now I just showed the tin oxide surface that has now been solved, but the other outstanding uh, problems out there, you probably need about a hundred atoms. You need to describe, uh, if, it's, if it's a bulk material, you need to describe a chunk of your bulk and then the defect you're interested in or whatever. If it's a surface, you need to describe sufficiently many layers of a slab model of your surface, sufficiently many layers that it's, it's, it's behaving like a surface and not like a thin film. And, uh, and then there was also the periodicity laterally along the surface. So 100 atoms is probably what you will need. And I, I just made a small uh, estimate here. So what does it take to do something with 100 atoms at the DFT level? And um, a single energy calculation takes uh, about an hour. I mean, it could, could be 10 minutes, could be five hours, but let's say about an hour. And then if, you, if you're doing a, um, a trajectory, so like the, uh, uh, the steepest descent I mentioned in, a, um, uh, in the basing hopping method, you, that, that steepest descent will take, um, or will involve like a hundred steps, could be less, but, but just for the sake of it. And that means that if, if your single energy calculation took an hour, then it takes you four days to just do that uh, steepest descent. And, um, and what if you want to do the molecular dynamics? Well, you probably need, you can do various estimates, you probably need 10,000 uh, energy evaluations to get a decent trajectory. Um, and then you're suddenly looking at, a, at one year computation. And, and of course you can have a parallel computer and, uh, and you can cut this in, in to, to one tenth or something, but it's still very, uh, it's still immense. And as I put here, the Monte Carlo approach uh, suffers the same thing because there you had uh, uh, this uh, issue of, I mean, having to, to do a lot of steepest descent or actually it's the basing coming that has this, uh, the same issue. So obviously, while DFT is a nice choice in terms of accuracy, it's a terrible choice in terms of computational cost if you're looking at a, at a, at a difficult problem. And what we would like to do is to exploit uh, data that we gather on the way to build a machine learning model that has the same accuracy as the DFT, but uh, comes at a much lower cost so that we can do these simulations. And um, here's sort of the outline for, for how to do it. So, so you, you, you have to gather the original data. So you have to do your DFT calculations a number of times. So here you have structures coming in to your VASP or I use GPAW, the uh, Danish Finnish uh, uh, VASP code uh, or DFT code. Um, whatever code you have here, um, and then out comes energies. You have to do a number of those, but then you, 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 you collect those just like uh, we saw yesterday in a database somehow, 
so that you can uh, uh, get them out again, manipulate them. And, and what you do is you train a, a model that uh, to begin with should just do the same as the DFT calculator did. So it should, should respond to any of those structures that you, uh, for which you know the energy, it should respond to those by uh, spitting out the energy. So you can think of this as a, um, I, I mean, it, it could be implemented as, 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 a, as a label. So you would say the energy is the label for this structure and then this learns all the labels, but you would rather want to implement it as a regression so that it can interpolate uh, be, um, uh, between uh, the data that it has been trained on. And uh, if you are successful in doing that, you will be able to use this uh, machine learned model to predict energies for uh, unknown structures, structures that you never had through your expensive DFT machinery, but that uh, you now make a um, a decent uh, prediction for via your machine learned uh, model. Um, already yesterday, uh, Luca uh, Gengeli uh, mentioned that then there's one thing that is important when you build such a model, and that is uh, the representation of the structure that you present it with. And, uh, and uh, I have a, a similar slide, a set of slides here. So, so if you translate, let's say this is a small molecule uh, for, for, that has coordinates x1. If you translate them, the, uh, the atoms, uh, then they get coordinates x2, which are different from x1. And if you rotate them, um, then you get coordinates x3 that are also different. Um, but since the, um, the Hamiltonian or the energy expression doesn't depend on the translation and the rotation of your molecule, uh, your machine should predict the same energy for all three uh, structures. And that is sort of a waste of machine learning if, if, uh, if this model here should be trained on, uh, to, should be trained to understand this. I mean, we already understand it when, when we see this, so why not help the machine so that it's, it doesn't have to learn that from the data? We give it uh, to it right away. And, and the way this is done is by saying, okay, we, we do not present the Cartesian coordinates directly to the machine. We do something to them first. We, we make a new representation. And that new representation should be such that it's already the same for these three cases. And uh, what I've come up with here is a uh, histogram of bundlings inside that molecule. So, so in Lucas' uh, um, uh, terminology of yesterday, each bar here would be a feature, and then altogether it's a descriptor. Um, uh, when, when you have all the bars. So, so the, the first bar is uh, indicating how many short bonds do you have? And then uh, as we go out this axis here, we, go, we get to larger and larger bonds. So, so, so by trend, making this transformation, we have made it much more easy for the uh, model to learn the, um, uh, the, that, that these three, or, uh, to, to learn the energies. And it, and it will immediately know that these three structures, uh, uh, since they have the same representation, also should have the same energy. There are much more elaborate ways of uh, making features that go into the descriptor. Um, and I'm sure you will hear about the, them in, in some of the other talks on how to make uh, machine learning potentials. I'll just bring up here one of uh, Volker Deringer's uh, uh, images, uh, he, and he will talk tomorrow, um, where he's uh, using this, the SOAP descriptor, which is uh, perhaps state of the art uh, uh, at the moment. Okay, so we still have the black box. I mean, now we have the representation, but we still have the black box. And, um, and for that, uh, there have been uh, two suggestions uh, over time that have sort of uh, proven to be 
the 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 ones uh, that that work. And uh, one is to have an artificial neural network, and the other is to have a Gaussian process regression um, formalism uh, to to make the um, to make the interpolation. I mean, they're both uh, regressors, uh, and and I'll I'll cover both of them, perhaps not in the same detail. I'll start with the second one, the Gaussian process regression, because that's one that requires very, very little data. And uh, that is, in a way, what we have when in, in this overall setup where we say, let's not do too many DFT calculations. Let's make a machine that can help us do the, uh, the search. Uh, then we are very sparse in data. We, we and um, and it's it's then oftentimes a preferred choice to to do the uh, the Gaussian process regression. And I'll, I'll illustrate uh, how effectful it can be. I, I show here the uh, the equations. Um, so so you have x that is your descriptor. And and uh, and now this is already the one that has the translation and rotational symmetry. Um, and then you, you, you need to address, what if you have two structures, uh, xi and xj, then you need to uh, come up with a, what is called a kernel element. You need to come up with, with something that uh, tells how similar are those two structures. I'll illustrate it in a minute. Uh, and you can see here, if, 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 they have this, if they have the same descriptor, then this will be a zero. And then there will be an exponential to, to the um, to the zero power here, so that's a one. So you will basically get this uh, theta naught out. So that sets the scales for how similar things can be. And then once you have that kernel, um, you you establish that for all data you have, and then that's this capital K up here. You you invert it. I'll come back to it in a minute, and then you can use that to predict the energy for any unknown structures based on energies of known structures. Okay, so, so it, it might look uh, complicated, but it's not. And let me dive into the detail here. So I, I set up a, um, a, a small, uh, actually a, a real DFT calculation. I did a search for what are the uh, local uh, minima in the energy landscape of six carbon atoms. And it came out with, uh, with those uh, six structures, or uh, seven structures that we see here. And I include the uh, descriptor. So that would be this uh, blue uh, histogram. You can see uh, this one is rather compact. So you have only small, short distances. This one is more elongated. You have long distances uh, represented as well. And, uh, and so it goes. And then we have the energy also given here. So it goes from uh, minus 41 EV up to minus uh, 36 EV, whatever. Um, so X, that was the description, descriptor, that's the blue histogram. And then we had this kernel. And, uh, and we can start evaluating the kernels, the kernel elements. And let's, let's now assume that we have found, we are doing a search, and we have found the four highest energy structures. And we, we still lack the, the three low energy structures, but we found the four high energy structures. Uh, we know their um, descriptors, we know their energy. And from this, we can evaluate, um, from, from, the, the, from the descriptors, we can evaluate all these kernel elements. So for instance, the, the first one here, if you ask how, how much does it look like itself? Um, what is the similarity of, of x3 to x3? Then, as I just said, then the uh, exponential here becomes zero, and it's just the, the theta naught. And if you choose that to 100, then it's easy to sort of interpret, because then it's 100% it's similar to itself. So, so, uh, so that, that's one kernel element. How similar is it to its neighbor here? Well, then you have to sort of evaluate the distance between these two uh, descriptors. And uh, since they are not fully overlapping here, uh, they will be, uh, um, there'll be some distance 
uh, and when you put it in here, it will uh, decay your uh, kernel away from the 100. And, and with these uh, particular uh, cases here, it ends up being uh, 85%. Similarity between these two structures. Um, then comes, uh, let's see if I can uh, make uh, some point here. Yeah, if we, if we take the similarity between these two, so the human eye, you would say, ah, okay, uh, they are not that different because all I need to do is to move one atom from over here to over here. Then I get this structure here. And that is actually also clear from the kernel element. They are more similar, these two structures, number five and number six, they are 94% similar. They're more similar than these two structures where you really have to move about, uh, move around a, a lot of atoms to, to make them look the same. So the kernel element simply just captures similarity. So now I have this matrix here. And, uh, and also I knew all the energies for these uh, four structures that I had found early on in the search. And uh, what I want to do now is to solve uh, a, a small uh, linear uh, a set of linear equations like this. I want to, to find the, um, the parameters alpha that if I multiply them onto, you can see here, they're here, alpha one, two, three, four. If I multiply them onto my kernel matrix, I should recover the energies. That is sort of the prerequisite. That was the first thing I had on it when, when I introduced the, the machine learning model, the black box was it should reproduce my, my data. And, um, and, and, and it's very simple because all you have to do is you have to multiply from the left side with, uh, with this uh, kernel matrix to the minus first. The inverse of the kernel matrix goes on the left side. And the only problem is that you might not be able to evaluate the, uh, the inverse uh, of, uh, of this matrix. And that is solved by adding a small bit to it down the diagonal. Um, by an analogy, there's a, uh, a method called kernel rich regression or rich regression, which would be this line here and then kernel uh, uh, no, wait, wait a minute. Rich regression just means that you add this term to the diagonal of your matrix uh, when you solve the, the problem. And, uh, and that's sort of standard in, in this Gaussian process regression. So now it's uh, solvable. And uh, you can see I, I got my alphas so that those are the, the values that should enter here. And I can make the sanity check. Do these alphas really reproduce my data? So I multiply them uh, onto the kernel matrix, and here are the, uh, uh, the, the energies that the model suggests, uh, and you can compare with those that were calculated at the DFT level. And uh, this, uh, I mean, the, the similarity here depends on uh, whether the, the rank is high enough of your kernel matrix. I mean, if you have structures that are exactly the same, then this falls apart. Uh, and also it depends on how much noise did you add down the diagonal uh, of the kernel matrix when you did the inversion. The more noise you add, the, the, less, the, the, um, the, the, the less well you reproduce your, uh, your energies uh, from the data. But uh, now we have alphas and we can, we can uh, we can then establish for any new structures that we may find, and, and we don't know yet how we found it, but let's see, we come about uh, this uh, uh, um, uh, structure here. Um, we could, could be, we get the idea, okay, we haven't, we haven't seen that yet, and we just move one atom, what could be that we did this Monte Carlo uh, or uh, molecular dynamic search. We come about that structure, and now we can ask the question, how similar is it to, to, the, to the four structures we already know? And you, you can see here, it says it's 92% similar to that one. It's 96% similar to that one. Yeah, we would have guessed that. It looks like that one, right? It's just one atom moved. And then it's 90 and 89% similar to the two latter ones. Okay, so, so, so it's, but it, it sort of inherits from all of them. 
but uh, but it look I mean mainly it looks like this one, and 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 now we have this um, 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 vector here, and we can just multiply it onto our uh, parameters, the alphas that we determined based on the data, and out comes a prediction. So the, this, based on, on knowing the energy of these four structures and based on, uh, on this uh, small model, we predict that this uh, structure here should have an energy of 40 EV, or minus 40 EV. And uh, you can see it had an energy of minus 39.5. So that's pretty good. And uh, you don't, you, it doesn't come with smaller data <laughs> than this. So four pieces of data, and you can make a, a decent prediction. Um, and, and inside this theory, you also have a, a, um, an expression for the uncertainty. Uh, and I cannot sort of motivate that as simply as I motivated the expression for the energy, but uh, just to take my word for it, it looks like this. So you, you, um, you have to basically take the, the unknown structure's similarity with itself and subtract uh, something that had to do with how you do the prediction. And the similarity with itself is, of course, the theta naught, one of the hyperparameters, um, and this one also scales with theta naught, so it's something smaller than theta naught, which becomes the it's actually the variance that we are looking at here. Uh, and 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 so so up here I've added uh, the um, uh, the uncertainty. It's actually two sigmas that I've added, and you can see that okay, it's uh, they are all well uh, inside the um, uh, the uncertainty. The, uh, this one here it doesn't really uh, come out well. Um, and apparently it's because, I mean, it also has the high certainty, uncertainty and the, the high uncertainty means that this one doesn't really look much like any of, of the data over here. I mean, you would say it looks like this one, but it doesn't because in this one, you still had a, a long distance and, uh, and you, you, can see the, the, you can see this histogram here is, is way different from that one. And then also it's, it's an underlying all this is a DFT calculation. So there might be some effects from the uh, describing the electrons uh, with wave functions that, um, that sort of comes as a surprise to a model like this. But uh, conclusion, Gaussian process regression takes almost no data and you can do the, uh, decent stuff. I have a, another example here. Um, I restrain myself to only considering two of the structures, but this time I uh, compress them and stretch them. So here I have 10 structures uh, of two kinds. One is this, uh, I don't know, uh, V-shaped, and the other is this, uh, I don't know, um, scepter <laughs> shaped <laughs> um, and and if i build a model only based on the uh, on the one with the red uh, uh, encirclement here or, or red um, uh, highlighting uh, if i build the, a model on that and and use that to predict i mean that's ridiculous i, I now i have a, a machine learning model with only one piece of data and i use that to predict the energy of, of the remaining nine then it looks like uh, we have over here in the diagram. So, so the one where I have the data, I hit precisely. So blue here is the true energy landscape and green is the prediction. And the shaded region here is the uncertainty. So I, I of course, hit my, my data point exactly. And then I get whatever for the rest. I mean, it doesn't make sense because there's nothing to learn yet. Um, but as soon as I add in uh, two more pieces of data here, so now I have... Uh, the same structure three times uh, uh, with various distances between the atoms. It's a uniform uh, uh, expansion that, that is done to it. Um, then you can see that, that the model sort of uh, learns uh, something. I mean, it hits the three data points, of course. In between the data points, it tells me it's, it's a bit uncertain, but not really uncertain. Then outside the, the last data point over here, it becomes really uncertain. And, um, and the funny thing is that it still, it still hasn't seen the, the model. It, it hasn't seen the, the scepter formed molecule, but it still sort of shapes the landscape over here in the right way. 
because it, it sort of realizes from the lower data that, ah, there's a, there's a preferred distance between atoms. And if, if, I, if I look at a different structure of atoms, then they should also attain that preferred distance. Or, I mean, at least that's the prediction. That's the only prediction you can make as long as you have no data of, uh, of this uh, structure form up here. And, um, and then we can give it a, a one piece up there. And then of course we can pin the prediction um, to, to the true blue line here, but, but that's not so important. It's, it's, it was more this thing that it can learn about optimal distances between atoms from other structures and then inf infer that when it considers new structures. And, 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 and that means that, I mean, in a, in a, in, in a global optimization uh, um, setting, you, you have found a number of local minima and you haven't yet found the global minimum. But at least once you get near that global minimum, you will know what should the right bond distances, distances be for the structure uh, uh, that describes that global uh, minimum. Powerful method, this uh, Gaussian process regression. And uh, in the tutorial, um, I put uh, some, um, some exercises where you, uh, where you can easily get a, uh, such a model. And, and what you can do is you can decide what data you give it. So, so um, uh, part of the tutorial is to give it, say, one fifth of your data, and then see uh, how does it perform. So that would be the, the blue part here. Out of the x-axis, we have the D of T energy. Out of the y-axis, we have the prediction. So you can see the, the data that you give it for training, it sort of describes perfectly well. This, this is now a, a small molecule uh, of uh, tin, Free oxygen six inspired by, by that small cluster on the surface. Um, and, um, and you can see the histograms are crazy for this one because they're just much more involved. And, and if you like, a part of the, uh, of the tutorial is to plot uh, these histograms and change the uh, descriptor and, or the elements in it and see what, how it changes. Getting back to the model, so so uh, so the, the the training data is a bunch of uh, structures that is uh, sort of correlated. So even when you only train on a subset of your training data, uh, the model presumably also knows quite a lot about the other data because they were sort of generated in the same way. And uh, and you you can see that in the model is not too crazy when it describes. The, um, the other part of the data. And then when I provide you with some test data, structures that uh, are completely uncorrelated to uh, the training data because they originate from a different search, different collection, uh, uh, other random seeds in a structural search. Um, then uh, we have the green points over here and you can see now uh, your model can, can make some really uh, crazy predictions. Uh, here we have DFT energies of the order minus 20 to minus 30, and the model predicts minus at 38. Then one can go back, and that's your exercise. Go back and uh, refine the model, have more data points to begin with out of the blue, oranges uh, datas and then see if, the, if that improves uh, on the test set. It should be formalized like uh, Luca Giangeli did yesterday where you sort of describe what is the, what is the root mean square uh, error on your test uh, data prediction as a function of your uh, setting, uh, how many data you, you train on and so on. But uh, I, I'm not sure we can, um, we don't have computational, uh, um, resources uh, that for all to do this at the workshop, but you, you can set that up when you get back. So the question is, I uh, ask that to the audience now, sh should we do that one exercise right now for, for like 30 minutes and then get back to the rest of the talk and then whatever time is left, we uh, spend on the, uh, there are some other exercises. Should we do that to sort of 
uh, yeah, to sort of let it sieve in. <laughs> okay, so uh, half an hour break while we do that, and to the uh, live uh, or to the Zoom audience, we'll be back quarter past 10 Berlin time. Is that okay? Yeah. Let's do that. So, I, um, the way you get to do the exercises is by going in on this website, mldft.com, which is uh, where I keep my, uh, my uh, blogs for, for, for work in the group. And then you, you, you visit anonymously and you click on the hammer group and you go, then you go down to the Nomad workshop unless you want to apply right away for this postdoc position that I, I mentioned. So, and, and then you get back into the Nomad uh, world uh, of uh, websites. It opens, do I have that? No, I don't have that. So it opens a, um, um, a Jupyter notebook. No, it opens a, a hub, and then you should find the, uh, the notebooks under ACOX. Oh, I didn't write that. Under ACOX uh, tutorial. Because now uh, it used to be only, let me put that here as well. No, I can't do that. Agox tutorial. Do you follow me? Yeah. Okay. I'll switch off the phone while I, I run around the room. I was uh, really impressed with uh, what I saw. So uh, uh, congrats to you. <laughs> and we will resume uh, this uh, after I've given the rest of the presentation and there will be a coffee break uh, in between as well. Okay. And I'm, I'm online with the mic, right? Yes, yeah. So um, I said there were two popular choices and, and now you have sort of a, a hands-on experience with one of them, namely the Gaussian process regression. So, uh, and uh, then there's the other one, the artificial neural network, uh, which I will just flash uh, uh, fast here to you. It actually turns out that in reality, um, both of these uh, methods are used not with a descriptor like the one you just inspected, the, the, this histogram for all uh, bond distances and all angles. They're actually used with uh, separate histograms, one for each atom in the system. So if we have this molecule, then, then uh, what would be a global descriptor is this gray histogram where all interatomic distances are just put into one histogram. But what is used in reality is a set of individual histograms, one for each atom. And here it's color coded. I think you can realize what I mean. And, and, and that's because then you, the machine you have to train should only understand what is the energy of an atom in a given environment. It should not understand what is the energy of a whole structure. So, so, so um, if you stuff the gray histogram into a machine, then that machine needs to know, needs to have seen a whole lot of uh, structures to start uh, uh, inferring about the energy. But if you stuff these um, uh, individual histograms into your machine, then uh, it, there's a lot, a, a lot, uh, you, need a, you need less data to get the same degree of learning and you can make more uh, or better predictions into regions uh, of structures that you have never uh, realized. Because you have realized the individual parts of new structures, but you, you never saw all those individual parts together as one structure. So that's, that's the sort of underlying approach in the method you'll see over the, I mean, the rest of today and tomorrow. And, um, and presumably also in, in, in those exercises. Now, if you, if you have a neural network as your regressor, the, the one that goes from the descriptor into a, an atomic energy, then it actually looks like this, that you have it a number of times. I mean, you have, you have a neural network here, you have another one here and so on, and, and, uh, and you pass in the, each piece of information from your structure, you get out individual energies, you add them up and get the total energy of that structure. Um, and uh, yeah, just zoom in on one of them. I, I won't, give, I mean, you have seen neural networks before. I won't give you all the details, but basically say that 
that it takes in, in the on the input side, it takes just the height of those histograms and then it, it mixes them non-linearly um, throughout the network and out comes the, the value in the end. And this non-linear mixing involves some linear coefficients W that are multiplied onto everything that comes in and then a non-linear function G in this case that uh, sort of uh, allows you to do better fitting. The Ws are unknown. They are the ones that we need to train, just like the alphas I had in the Gaussian process regression uh, were unknown. Then, then these uh, Ws are unknown, and the way we train them is we, we, we take a number of structures that we know, and then we have the descriptors. So these are now for the individual atoms. We get, let the network predict the energy for those atoms. We add up all the uh, contributions. And for each structure, we get a predicted energy. I, I didn't put an index here on, but these are five different values, uh, one for each of these five structures. And then we, we have this problem that the Ws are unknown, but we can, uh, we can formulate a loss function, which is the difference between the known energy for each structure and the predicted energy right now with the Ws we have at the given moment, that difference, we square it and add it up. And then also we, we uh, square all the coefficients and add them up because we don't want large coefficients. That's typically not good for fitting to have large coefficients. I didn't have that really for my uh, Gaussian process regression, but it was implicit in this diagonal term that was added before the diagonalization or the, the inversion. So we add up also the values uh, of the coefficient squared. And then all this is a function that we try to uh, minimize. So we try to find in that landscape with, with Stevens descent uh, or Adam's uh, uh, optimized algorithm or whatever, we try to find those Ws that minimize this loss function. And once we have those, we hope and pray to that this model uh, also have some predictive power. Uh, meaning that we can then introduce an unknown structure, have it uh, predict energies for each of the atoms, add up those energies and get the total prediction for that unknown structure. And uh, I will just, uh, I'll give a real life example where we did this. And it was for 13 atoms on an uh, oxide support. It was inspired by work done uh, in the UC Landman group at Georgia Tech. They had uh, been very brave and had done what we estimate was uh, three and a half thousand DFT energy evaluations because they, they published 36 different geometries for this uh, uh, particle on the magnesium oxide surface. And they, um, um, uh, 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 and they had done a local relaxation for each of them. So that's, that's why we, we get to three and a half thousand, we, we multiply by 100. So presumably three and a half thousand DFT calculations can give you uh, a, a guess for the best structure of uh, 13 platinum atoms that looks like this. And uh, then what we did was we adopted this neural network approach. Uh, we did uh, uh, Monte Carlo searches, uh, but in a uh, model landscape described by the, by the network. And I'll show in a minute how we trained the network. And then the, um, uh, in total, we did 180,000 energy evaluations, uh, out of which only uh, less than 2,000 were DFT calculations. So we, we spent like half the effort of the uh, Landmann group on the DFT side, and then we spent a whole lot of more time on the uh, neural network side. And uh, here's a simulation of what came out. So on the left-hand side, we see the, the latest structure that the, the basing hopping search uh, has uh, realized. And on the right-hand side, we see the best structure seen so far. And here are the energies down here in the lower part of the diagram. And, uh, and you can see we found a different structure. This one 
than the one found by the Landman group, um, basically because we could do uh, almost two orders of magnitude more energy evaluations and get more around in this configuration space because we had a faster method with the machine learning approach. And, and then you may say, why didn't these guys, when they did 36 different structures for platinum 13, why didn't they consider that such a nice pyramidal structure uh, could be a candidate for the best structure? They didn't do that because it's a hollow pyramid. And uh, humans, they normally don't think that that the metals are, uh, or chunk, small chunks of metals could be hollow. Uh, or chunks is a big word in, in an institute like this. So, so nanoparticles, people don't think that nanoparticles of me, uh, metallic nanoparticles could be hollow. But it actually turns out that the, that this, uh, the preferred way of, of organizing 13 uh, platinum atoms is uh, as a hollow pyramid. And uh, we, we found a whole lot of other structures, another six structures, were also stable, that were all more energy favorable, more favorable energy-wise than the structure found in the previous search. So it just shows you why there is we need to do the global optimization and why it is we need to do it automatically and with the basing hopping, just let it run, and, and why it is we need orders of magnitude more. Um, configurations, then you can cover if you do this by hand and with, with, at the full DFT level. So I, I promised to say something about how we trained the, the neural network and, uh, and it's given here. So, so basically we, we had to start out from something. So we had a hundred, about a hundred DFT structures that the initial neural network was trained on. And then we let it loose and, and did the basing hopping search. So that would be, we, we perturbed one structure and relaxed it uh, by our steepest descent into uh, the nearest local minimum. And then the data that was generated there um, was still at the uh, model level because otherwise we could not have done it. But then the final structure was, was done at the DFT level, added to the training data, um, the, uh, a new round of, of optimizing those Ws in the neural network was, was made, and it was now a more accurate uh, neural network, and we repeated this process over and over again. And uh, here's uh, Espen, my student, who, who did this, and, and the diagram he made of how, how this goes about. And, and you can see it's, uh, you, you, you start out here to begin with, and you create this um, new structure and you relax it and so on. And it's actually also an evolutionary algorithm with the population and all. And I don't expect you to understand all the details, just sort of, or perhaps it's a proof by intimidation here, uh, but, but we can try and simplify it a little bit. So, so what is it that goes on here? Well, it's basically, you are having a, uh, a population of structures. You are generating new candidates uh, by some means that I explained several times already. Then you do your machine learning optimization. I've lost my pointer. Um, if it's okay, I'll get it back here. Laser pointer. You do your machine learning uh, optimization and, uh, and then you evaluate one of the candidates or more of them or whatever uh, in the end. So, so that's basically what goes on. And you, you, here I didn't leave room for the training of the network. But what we have realized since, uh, I mean, in these five years that have passed, is that, that this loop is the same loop as uh, in anything else, uh, except for some details. So, so let me present you here with, with all kinds of, um, of methods. So let's say you just did an evolutionary algorithm um, and you did it at the DFT level. Well, then you are just leaving out this machine learning optimization uh, part you're not having a, a, a model to help you, but, but the, the, the method looks the same. And what if you have um, the basing hopping? Well, the basing hopping looks exactly the same as an evolutionary algorithm, except that you only have one candidate at a time. An evolutionary algorithm has a population and you do uh, something to the entire population all the time. 
if you just do Basinghoff and you do something to one candidate, follow that around. And, uh, and there's even a more simple method here, the random structure search uh, by Richard Neitz and, uh, uh, and collaborators, where you basically just start out in your landscape at a random position and do the uh, steepest descent. And you can see that they, these methods, and, and there are more of them, they contain the exact same elements, all of them. And uh, Mas Peter uh, Christiansen, my, my postdoc, he, he has uh, sort of organized that in a way where you have modules you just uh, put together one after the other. Uh, so, so one module would be, if you, if you have this yellow part where you do the relaxation in, in, the, in, the, um, in the model landscape, then you would need uh, this part here, just a model GPR dot default. Uh, it needs to know a little bit about uh, uh, what structure it works on and, uh, and what database to put the result in and so on. But that's basically, oh, oh no, what database to take the data from, of course, uh, once it trains. That, that is the sort of the, the, the new abstraction. So, so you can, if you, if you use this AGOX library, you can put together uh, whatever uh, optimization algorithm you want with whatever elements you want, whether it has the machine learning or not, by simply uh, um, uh, putting these modules one after the other. The next one here is, is one that relaxes in the model landscape. Uh, and the final one is the one that sets up the whole simulation. And uh, you have just been using the other one. So in, in your notebooks, it was uh, said, it was called something like get model potential or something, get model, whatever. Um, but it's a wrapper that I put in one of the folders, the, the one called um, uh, utils, uh, where you have the utilities for the exercise. Uh, and then in the file models.py, and inside that one uh, is, uh, is a function that wraps this module. So you have already experienced now what it is to use this uh, set of uh, codes. And exercise five and six, they, uh, they are actually not real exercises because I, I figured we would not have time to do them. So they are more examples of using uh, various algorithms uh, from this library. And if some of you have time to do it uh, at the end of the day, uh, we, 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 I can help you with it. But now that we have this, yeah. Yeah, but uh, I've been allowed to sort of uh, exceed with 10 minutes or something. Yeah. Okay. Is it okay? Yeah. Yeah. And then we have, so 10 minutes, more minutes, then we have the coffee break, and then we come back for the rest of the talk and the rest of the uh, tutorial. Yeah. Sorry, we didn't keep you in the loop. <laughs> um, so here's just an example where we return to this uh, uh, tin oxide surface reconstruction and inspect now uh, how difficult is it? How, how much computational effort goes into finding this solution uh, with and without a machine learned model? So, so the, um, uh, the, the red and yellow uh, uh, curves over here, they show, that, let's go for the last one down here. They show how many CPU hours you need to spend. I mean, if you start a simulation and you sit down and wait for it to find the um, solution, then you need to wait about 2000 hours with, with, the, with this type of model or this type of um, search, 2000 hours before you have 50% likelihood of having found the global minimum, which is the one depicted. So, so I mean, it, it's, it's stochastic. So, so you can be lucky and find it right away. I mean, if, if you after 500 hours, you might have found it in every 10th of your uh, independence searches you have started. But after 2000 hours, you, you will most likely have found it in five out of 10. And then you, I mean, then that's presumably good enough and you can, you can stop. So this is when you don't introduce this element of asking a machine learned model to assist you. And if you ask such a model to assist you, 
Then it's the blue curves that uh, that, that govern. Or, or, um, and then you you actually after 500 hours you are you nine out of your 10 independent searches have now found the optimum structure showing how uh, powerful it is to to use the expensive dft data that you are evaluating every now and then in your search to to use them as a uh, to formulate a model and then use that model to do parts of your search. So, so that's what I try to depict here. I'm not sure if I get, if it's a really good illustration, but I try to say that normally you would, you would do your DFT relaxation. I mean, whatever your molecular dynamics, your Monte Carlo, your basing hopping search, you would do that and you would do all relaxation steps with the expensive energy calculator. But if you can bypass some of it uh, by, by establishing a decent model and then only do the DFT calculation for the final structure, it will, not, it will not end up the right place. That is what exercise four is about. There you will inspect where do I end up when I trust the model. It will not end up the right place, but it will end up in a place that provides you new information that will improve the model so that next time you are in that neighborhood, you will uh, be more correct. So, so this, is, this is the trick of sort of introducing the machine learning model, or here it's called the surrogate model. Another trick that, we have, that I've already used now is why only do that for one structure? Why, I mean, now that it's so cheap to, to uh, do the, the local relaxation, why don't you perturb your, uh, all your members of your population uh, a number of times uh, in different ways, and then do local relaxations of all those in that surrogate energy landscape, which is cheap. And then you end up with a whole bunch of new candidates for good structures. And then you just need to, to take the most promising out of those. That's, that's sort of the next uh, thing that, that the machine learning potential opens up as a possibility for you. And that's one more thing. And that's uh, sort of touching upon Bayesian statistics, which is, uh, is this afternoon's uh, topic. Um, I mean, now that you are having a, a you have, you're having a true DFT energy landscape, that's this blue curve. And you, you uh, have these data points, the, uh, uh, the red dots, and you have a model that you have built based on those red dots. The model is the green curve, and the green curve, if it comes out of um, my Gaussian process regression, it has the uncertainty. I can plot the uncertainty. If it comes out of uh, the neural network, then we need this uh, ensemble average and the ensemble, I mean, several networks to sort of uh, discuss do they agree on the energy or not? And then depending on how uh, much disagreement they have, you, you evaluate a, an uncertainty. But now we, if we let's stick with the Gaussian process uh, regression method. Then it just comes out of the equations. And I can plot this, uh, this green curve or, or green shaded area. Uh, and, and that's basically what it says is that whenever I leave a data point, I start sort of become uncertain on my prediction. That's what it says. So it, it sort of helps you tell where in this huge configuration space have I not been. And, um, and then uh, the, the, the methods, they said, let's uh, randomize uh, some of the structures we have already and, and do a, a, a steepest descent where we end up uh, so here we have done the randomization. So, so I, 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 I will flip back. I had the data points, they were red. And then I have the randomized stru structures that I'm going to relax in a minute. They are now orange. You can see they, they lie away from, from where I'm certain about the, the model. And then the patient statistics is about saying, I, I get the most informative new piece of data if I relax not on the energy landscape, but on the lower confidence bound, which is 
the energy landscape minus a number of times the uncertainty. Kappa is a is a is a is a, a scalar. We usually just use two because then that, that's what you use in many uh, situations. And uh, sigma is the um, standard deviation. Okay, so we relax on that landscape, and and you can see it, that biases uh, my expectation towards regions I've not been, and that is what global optimization is about. I mean, you get into the regions where you've not been and see if there's anything interesting there. So, so, uh, so in the end, after that relaxation of a lot of candidates in the uh, surrogate energy landscape or well, the, the lower confidence bound landscape, you then take the one with the lowest energy and do the DFT calculation for that one. So you're really, really specified uh, how often you do DFT calculations because they are the expensive ones and you have biased your, your search in direction of low energy and high uncertainty. And when you combine all that, it looks like this. It's really uh, amazing. And uh, the, an evolutionary search takes just short of 20,000 DFT evaluations to be 50% certain you have found the global minimum energy structure for this tin oxide. Whereas this other method that we, we call GOFI, global optimization for first energy, first principles energy expressions, and, and yeah, it should probably have, have, have been called something with Bayesian because it, it sort of hides the fact that it, it's a Bayesian method. That only requires about 250 DFT calculations to find the global minimum with the same uh, fidelity. And, uh, and you can play around with this Kappa value. Uh, so that's how many times you, uh, how much you weigh in the, um, the uncertainty. So if you weigh in a, a, a whole lot, you, um, you really push your search in the direction of regions you have never been. And, and uh, that's what this diagram shows here, that then you get really uh, new crazy structures for, for this. This is a, a molecule of a given stoichiometry we have searched for the, the, the best structure. And if you, if you rather use very small values for Kappa, you can even penalize with negative values, makes no sense in, in a patient's sense, but, but just for the fun of it, then you, you are biasing towards finding structures that look like uh, those structures you've already found because you sort of confine the search to uh, where you have been, where you can really predict a, a low energy. Um, and, and this is an excellent place to have the coffee break because now I'll change topic. I, I've spent all the time so far on machine learning potentials. And now I'll, I'll uh, ask the question, can we use uh, machine learning in an even more clever way? Can we sort of expect artificial intelligence? I mean, not only get assisted with, I mean, getting around with the DFT calculations in a cheap way, that's what I've presented so far. Can we actually get the machinery to draw the solution for us? I mean, ideally, it should, it should make that uh, hollow uh, platinum 13 cluster right uh, away, just like the chat GPT. You ask it, what is the structure? And then you should say, I think it's a hollow uh, pyramid. Um, we're not there, but I have a, a, a little peek into what could be done to, to get there. So, but let's have a coffee break. And um, you know how much time we have, yeah? Yeah, thank you. We still have probably time for some questions also now. Yeah, thank you. So uh, before the break, I said now it's sort of step up and uh, not only ask the, um, the model to help me get cheap DFT quality images, but I would ask the model to give me the solution to the global optimization problem um, altogether. So, so, so I, I depict it here. So, so I'll give it the empty uh, support and then say, how would you put 13 uh, uh, platinum atoms? And then it should spit out the solution, just like uh, chat GPT or, or some other resources where, I mean, when, when we started this work, we were inspired by uh, AlphaGo from uh, Google DeepMind that, um, that has a technology where they, they can take this uh, Go board game, uh, look at it, and then um, 
run it through some uh, deep neural nets and uh, end up with a, a value that sort of says what the likelihood is for the for white, I guess, for the white pieces to win this game. And um, and then they also they can run it through some other um, uh, deep uh, neural net, presumably sharing some of the other layers from from the first one, and then that network will will output uh, a, a whole image of the board saying, given this uh, current position, where should you put the next uh, stone in order to improve your chances of of winning? So so that's that's what they they made and. Uh, and they, uh, after a couple of attempts, they, they were capable of beating uh, the world champion in, in this board game, Lee all. And there's a two hour YouTube uh, movie of this that I have personally seen three times. <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, and you can see his agony there. Uh, he's really suffering uh, against the computer. So we wanted to copy that technology onto uh, our problem of uh, global optimization of structure um, at the atomistic level. And, and here's how we implemented it. So, so you have a, a, a state uh, of the system. So that's a number of atoms placed so far. Uh, then you digitize it so that uh, uh, you have this grid here and either there's a one if there's an atom and zero if there's no atom, then you have the uh, uh, deep neural net here, number of layers, and, and that spits out, once it has been trained, it spits out a heat uh, diagram of where to put the next atom in order to end up with the most stable molecule or crystal or whatever you're building in the end. I mean, not, not to sort of optimize the position, the, where to place the next atom to get the strongest bond of that atom, but where to put the next atom so that you overall build a very stable structure. Just like in the Go board game, you want to win the game. You don't want to sort of get a small advantage in the next move that you might uh, uh, not that might not lead to you winning. And uh, and this technology is a convolutional. Uh, neural net, so you you uh, to keep the number of parameters low, you you run over uh, the uh, you run over space and 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 the sort of uh, the input you get runs through the the same network, and uh, and if you translate the input, you will also translate the um, the output uh, because because of the convolutional neural net, and and here's a, an outline. It's it's rather complicated, uh, but. I already said in word, word, words what was uh, being done. So, so basically, we have this this machinery here that can that can point out where to place the next atom to eventually build the best structure. So, so we we employ that technology a number of times, and each time we place one atom, and then in the end we have placed all our atoms, and we are ready to uh, get the information about how stable the structure was when we followed the um, direction that the neural network gave us. So we, we have a final structure in the end after placing all the atoms. I'll give an example in just a minute. Um, and then, uh, so we have the final structure. We can evaluate its energy with density functional theory. We can look in our database of previous systems we looked at, extract some of them, and then all that data can be used for one episode of training the neural network so that in the next build, it gets those heat diagrams, those indications of where to put atoms, it gets them a bit more correct than in, in this round. And then very fast, such a method will sort of build one structure and keep building that structure because that's the one structure it has gotten the, the, the highest reward from or the best energy once it had built it and did the DFT calculation. So we have to sort of divert from that. So we, whenever we get the heat diagram, we, and, and here we see the heat diagram from the side. The higher up, the more blue, the more, 
the more the network believes here's where you should put the atom, then we should we need a policy. And the policy is that we more or less always put the atom exactly where the network dictates it should be put. But then occasionally we deviate from that and put it elsewhere. So you can see the, 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 that's what this green uh, thing here means. So, so, so high likelihood for putting it right at the top of, of where the network uh, says is best, a, a, a high or a decent uh, likelihood for putting it in the neighborhood of that top or at other tops in the landscape or in the heat diagram, and then a baseline uh, uh, likelihood for putting it just randomly somewhere to, to get some exploration of space. And that's why it's called epsilon greedy up here. So, so you do not just place the atom exactly where it's predicted. You also explore a little bit. That's also how they train the, uh, the AlphaGo um, uh, um, machinery network, whatever. There's some, some issues. I mean, this uh, it's it's beneficial to to take whatever data you have and and rotate it and and tell the network it should um, expect the same reward at the end if it if it had this rotated. Uh, data and also it's a straightforward generalization. If you have more than one species, you just uh, you just give more than one uh, input layer to your uh, neural net, and you you get uh, more than one output layer, one layer for each atomic species. Very, very straightforward. And um, and then I, I mean I had I think I had six people in my lab working for a year and a half, if not two. And then we ended up with, with something that uh, works very nicely. I'll show it to you here. So initially, the network is, is not trained. And, and it just spits out completely random information. Uh, it has a random idea about where, where is it beneficial to put atoms. So, so we have here space, and we have a carbon atom. It's, it's space on a periodic uh, boundary conditions. And, and the network says uh, here and there and there perhaps is a very good place to put your next carbon atom. In the end, once you have put all your 24 carbon atoms that you have, you will get a, a high reward. I mean, it doesn't know anything about it because it's just random coefficients to begin with. But let's follow what it suggests. So we put one there at the darkest spot, and now the darkest spot is there. We put one there and so on. I mean, it, since it didn't know anything, it also builds a ridiculous structure. And when we calculate the energy, the energy turns out to be 10 EV above the lowest energy state you can get. And that's actually 10 EV per atom. It's a completely ridiculous. Uh, but, and you need a very robust uh, energy calculator to sort of allow for those crazy structures. But now the network has at least a little bit to train on. And it trains, and it does so for, I think it's 200 episodes. And then after 200 episodes, where it has done things like this and slightly uh, improved slightly along the way, it, uh, it, um, it spits out this heat map when it sees the first atom. It says, yeah, you should put the next atom uh, quite close to the first one. And uh, when we do that, it says you should put the third atom at the end of uh, this timer. And you should put the fourth atom at the end of the trimer and so on. And it actually has taught itself. Rem remember, there was no human involved at all in this. It just ran by itself. It has taught itself that uh, building linear structures of uh, carbon is a very good thing to do. And now it runs out of space. I mean, I, I hinted that I had 24 atoms that should end up in this cell. And, and we have not accommodated 24 atoms yet. If we run out of space, but you can see it says, OK, we can squeeze in some here and there. And, and here you can really see the convolutional nature of the uh, um, uh, of this apparatus here, that it is sort of gives you more or less the same output uh, at places that look the same. That's what an, a, a convolution uh, does. Um, so we place the, the final atoms, ruined our structure a bit, but now it's only two EV per atom less stable than the global energy minimum that we, of course, don't know uh, yet, but, but that's, that's the important thing. We don't need to know it because that's what is coming out of the search. After a thousand episodes, it has refined its understanding of how to put atoms into this cell in order to get a high reward in the end. 
it says, if I see an atom there, there's a, there's a very definite ring around it where I could put the next atom. And then there's even a, 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 a shell further out where it could also put it. And when it does so, it uh, says, ah, and then you should not build this linear structure because that only ends up with a, you know, the, the reward of two EV per atom. You should, you should build it at an angle. And the more atoms it places, the more confident it is that it should build something that eventually is uh, graphene. And it's just, I mean, no human was involved or it, it, it happened all by itself. So in a way you can see, if I could only now say that this was, uh, we had the same thing for the uh, platinum 13. And uh, I mean, in, in a way that's what we want. We want to sort of uh, let loose a machinery like this on a problem. And then the, the, the machine is allowed to sort of uh, explore uh, uh, new regions, uh, exploit what it already knows, store it in a, in a way that sort of facilitates the, the building of new great structures. And um, I'll show you a, an example right at the end where we almost are there with the uh, platinum 13. It's just, it takes GPUs and uh, my research group doesn't have many of those. So, uh, so we sort of terminated uh, that search. Uh, as long as you stay in 2D, uh, 2D, for 2D systems, you can do this with um, CPUs and, uh, and therefore I have more examples with that. So my next example is, is that of um, uh, oxidation of palladium. And uh, here you have the XPS uh, spectra for the various structures that form along the way. And, um, and some, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago, uh, it was still a, a, a challenge to find the root five by root five structure, which is the, the one that forms at the highest uh, oxygen dosage. And, uh, and, and now if you do the basing hopping approach, uh, it, it really comes out and, and it looks like this. Uh, it's, uh, it's trivial now with the methods we have uh, nowadays. But if you look over here, we, um, we passed through a five by five structure so that's a structure that, that lives on 25 palladium atoms on the surface. It doesn't have to contain 25 palladium atoms in, in the upper layer, the, ox, the thin oxide that forms, um, and, and it's unknown how many oxygens are involved, but it must be something in between uh, the, the half monolayer down here and whatever it is up there. Um, it's an... Uh, it's a meter stable structure, so uh, there's not much experimental information about it, but we can see from the XPS that it's at least not exactly like, uh, like this one. It's, it's some other structure. And uh, we're looking into uh, finding that with this machinery because it's a nice 2D uh, problem. And, um, and here we train a, 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 this reinforcement agent to uh, to learn about how does palladium and oxygen interact, um, not in the full cell, not in the five by five, because that's the very complicated problem we want to solve in the end, but we do it in a smaller cell, a three by three cell. So, so we, just, uh, we just let it, um, uh, we run a, a basing hopping search in this small cell, and then every structure ever built in that basing hopping search we take a part and feed uh, into the um, uh, to the agent as initial training data. So that's in a way a supervised training, but supervised by a basing hopping search. So, so we generate a whole lot of data, and then the agent starts to understand how does palladium and oxygen interact when you when you aim at optimizing. Uh, the, the, or, or yeah, optimizing the stability of the final structure you, you build. So, so this is not what I, the same thing as I had in the previous part of the presentation where it was, how does oxygen and palladium interact when they are at a certain distance and when they are at a certain angle and, and all that. I mean, it's, it's not a machine learning potential, it's a prediction of how stable can the final structure be if I place an atom somewhere now. So, so let's look at it. So, so we have here, that's a palladium atom. 
and uh, we can we can place it elsewhere and ask this agent that has now been trained on all this data coming out of uh, the basing hopping search um, and we can place it different places here and and then see that that now the colors are fading so if i place that palladium right there in the middle i will presumably run out of options for placing the last atoms so i should i should place it more here to the side because then then there's a good option for placing a, a palladium down there and and uh, i could also place it uh, here then there's a good option up there i mean it's it's sort of making the the, the human kind of thinking here it's not not just saying uh, i should place it so that it is at a bond length distance from one of the other palladium atoms as as the machine learning potential would tell us it's thinking about oh, it's not thinking but it's 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 making a more elaborate calculation about what makes sense now if i'm going to build a very good structure, just like in the Go board game. What makes sense now if I'm going to win this game? So, so uh, it's just an example here and, and uh, we can let it be at that position and then place the oxygen and see what that matters. So again, sometimes colors are fading and, and we really run out of options where to put palladium if I place the oxygen there. It's, it's better to place it here, for instance, then, then there are some dark regions so I still have good options for placing palladium and a prediction that in the end, the structure can be highly stable. That's, that's what it tells me. So it's a, it's a higher level agent than, than the one that predicts energy. I've, I've said that a number of times. Okay, so, so this is the initial training of the agent. Now we let it loose on the big five by five system. And, um, and here we have a case where some of the atoms have been placed already. So that's, uh, that's taken from a search where, where that was a motive that kept coming out. So, so now for the illustrative purpose here, I keep all those atoms that, that you see now, I keep them in those positions. And then I only place the remaining ones, but I place them under that um, um, training, protocol that I introduced when I introduced the method. So now it really runs by itself. I mean, previously it was sort of pre-trained with the help of a basing hopping search, not a human, but a basing hopping search on a smaller system. Now it attacks the big system. And it already at the beginning has a good idea. Well, this is not at the beginning. This is, this is after having run for a while. It, it, it forms this a very, very elaborate uh, map I mean, it, it, um, we, have a, we have a limit on how far away atoms may be placed um, relative to already placed atoms. So that's why it's completely wide in the middle. But it has a good idea about where to place atoms. I mean, it, it certainly um, uh, there's some hot spots here at places and, and we can uh, follow it. So, so this is what it eventually converges on doing. Uh, it's a little funny that it sort of starts building into the void there. Um, and, and, but that's because we do no regularization on, on, on how it, it, it may uh, cover space. So, so it, has, it has found after a while that this year leads to winning the competition of finding the best structure of uh, palladium oxide uh, with this stoichiometry um, on, a, on a palladium uh, substrate. You know, I have the last one there. And, and you can see here, again, it's relatively small numbers. So, so there were the 1,000 uh, supervised episodes where it, it took a database from um, another search and sort of learned the sort of the overall interaction of, of these type of atoms. And then uh, here it has done another 2,500 episodes where it has attacked this real problem. And, um, and it, uh, the question is, did it, was it just lucky to make that one build? But you can take the same agent and then you can force it to build in another sequence. So that's what I do here. So, so you can see here, here it's, it's the same agent. And, and this agent now has to cope with the situation that oxygen is placed there, whereas this one has to cope with the situation that is placed here. And, and you can see, they, they still, I mean, now they go completely different ways. 
But the same agent is capable of making sense out of the different situations that are, are met on the way. And that's also like a little bit of human behavior that, I mean, you don't get completely fooled by doing things in a, in a slightly different order. And, and uh, normally you would fear that you could overtrain and your agent would just be good at doing something uh, in one sequence. And uh, here's not the platinum 13, but a platinum eight cluster on graphene, just to show that, yes, we can take it into three dimensions uh, and uh, uh, have the agent train itself on a problem. And, uh, and the structure it comes out with here uh, we, uh, is here purely found with this reinforcement learning by an agent of the uh, uh, AlphaGo style. And it, it, has, uh, it has never sort of benefited from any human input or any um, other type of search. And, and uh, I think once we get more GPUs, this takes GPUs, you can it's sort of illustrated over here that the, the, the way you collect data and, and the way the neural network is set up takes more computing power. Once we get more uh, GPUs, we will move in this direction and then have the machine uh, do the build of new structures, not stochastically as I did in the first part of the presentation where I always said, I have a population, I pick some members, I perturb them in some stochastic way, I rattle them or I interchange the atomic species or whatever, and then relax into the nearest local minimum and all that. That's not the future. The future is to have agents that right away say, ah, okay, given eight platinum atoms, I would do this, or perhaps a couple of other um, uh, solutions. And if you, if you drag one of the atoms out of position, if you say, no, you, I give you already five atoms flat on the surface, you cannot build this one, then the same agent should be able to right away build the best structure or come up with a couple of suggestions of best structures given that condition. So that was the presentation. I'll just uh, thank uh, the guys involved. Uh, uh, Melde here did the um, Gothi method and uh, Mas Peter here, he does the uh, um, AGOX library development together with Nikolai over here. And, uh, and uh, Nikolai has uh, made a a new Gaussian process regression model that is very akin to the gap model that Volker Deringer will tell you about tomorrow. And uh, that's available from inside the AGOX uh, libraries uh, for, for you to use. And, and with that, uh, I'm done. And then we should sort of resume the tutorial uh, from exercise three, uh, four, and, and perhaps some of you can look into five, uh, or you can do it tonight. <laughs> Thank you for, for the attention.